2020. And um, next week we're going to be having our second big lab exam, lab exam two. And since we're still on the shelter in place, we're going to be doing um, our lab exam two online. And so folks were asking for some practice questions like we had um, for our first lab exam, we had some practice questions. So I started working on this folks. So um, um, let me just let me just go through this little intro here. So first of all, folks, these are just some examples. So don't just study these sample questions, right? You need to use your lab exam to study guide questions, you know, to make sure you're thoroughly prepared. And um, do be aware, you guys, that sometimes people think since it's going to be online and since we're saying that it's open book and open notes, some people might think they don't need to study for it. But it's so important, you guys, that you do know the information as if you were taking it closed book, closed notes, because um, you'll only have 90 minutes to finish. And if you have to look up everything, right, it's, it'll slow you down. And there's a really good chance you won't finish in time. So just make sure, you know, try to study as if this was like in the old days, the face-to-face -face days, right? So you want to um, be able to answer the questions quickly. There'll be a lot of integration type questions, um, maybe some clinical cases. So um, that's when you have to know a lot of facts and then weave them together. Um, do remember, you guys, even though it's an online exam and we're saying it's open book, open note, we're, we are relying on your honesty that you're doing it by yourself, right? And we know you guys are honest. We know you're most of you are going into some aspect of, of health care where people's lives will be in your hands. So we know you're going to be honest. Okay. So, folks, this, this first part, part one. Oh, a bee just flew into the room. Okay. Hopefully, I won't make it angry. Um, this first part, you guys, it's on um, some samples from chapter 21, um, arthropod vectors and helmets. And then the second part is on microbial media. And it ended up, I ended up, gosh, it's like 12 pages. Isn't that ridiculous? I was just going to give you some sample um, questions. But I thought I would just go through this really briefly um, just to give you an idea of how it's set up. So in this first part, you guys, we're showing you photos of um, vectors. And of course, I have a hard time talking to my little MacBook here, you guys. So, um, so we give you some vectors. So this is a flea, um, and here we have ticks. And so the whole idea is that we give you photos of vectors, and then there will be a list of diseases or pathogens that these vectors can transfer. So you're gonna in the the um, the next pages, you're gonna match the disease or the pathogen to the vector. So we have mosquitoes. And the idea here is you give the name of the vector and then you provide the name of the disease and the pathogen that the vector is going to transfer. Okay, and then we have some triatomas. This is glycina. And then here are the names of the diseases, folks. So what you want to do is match the disease um, and the pathogen to the name of the vector, right? And so you want to practice providing the name of the vector. And you do want to try to use the scientific names, right? Common names are okay, but ideally you'd be learning scientific names. So this first one is uh, murine or endemic typhus caused by the bacterium Rickettsia typhi. This is a bonus question, you guys. We said we just added as a bonus. Um, here we're asking you what's the vector for Yersinia pestis. So you want to try to identify the disease and then provide the vector. Um, here, hmm, this person has a swelling around her eye, um, so this is caused by Trypanosoma crucii, so you want to give the name of the disease and then the vector, again, matching them to the photos above. And then this is a pathogen found in some parts of Africa, so it's a blood smear, and here's the pathogen, so we want the um, name of the pathogen, the disease, and its vector. Here's an interesting skin lesion caused by the bacterial spirochete Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi, so the name of the disease and the vector. Here's a poor person suffering with an infection um, by Wuchereria bancrofti, so what's the name of the disease and what's the vector. And then the next page here, you guys. So this is a peripheral blood smear. Um, these red blood cells, it, they've been stained, so that's why they don't appear red, have been infected with the uh, um, protozoal parasite Plasmodium. The uh, person is experiencing cyclical fever. So what's the name of the disease? What's the vector? And then here, 
excuse me, here um, in this patient, the sclera, the white part of the eye, is appearing yellow, right? So icteric appearing icteric. And so this person is suffering with yellow fever, so you want to provide the name of the pathogen and the vector. And this poor little baby has been infected by the Zika virus, so you want to know the vector. And um, you want to know, we're concerned when pregnant moms get infected with Zika virus because the virus crosses the placenta and invades the baby and, and focuses on the baby's neurons and um, can cause really serious neurological abnormalities. And this last one is a patient suffering with dengue. Um, so we want to know what's the vector of the dengue virus. Okay. And then the second part is on helmets. So here we're going to show you some photos of, um, of either the helmets themselves. Um, I'm, I can't remember, you guys, if I put some, some victims in here. But what you're going to do is match the disease, um, provide the scientific name of the helmet, and remember classification, you guys. So all the helmets, oops, all of the helmets are, they belong to domain Eukarya, Kingdom Animalia, right? But do remember, you guys, we want you to know if it's a trematode, a fluke, a nematode, a roundworm, or a cestode, a tapeworm. So the first one here, these are um, adults that are, um, are the cause of ascariasis. So you want to provide the scientific name and the transmission. And is it a cestode, a nematode, or a trematode? This is uh, section through muscle. And we see these little immature forms right here. This is called trichinosis. So what's the scientific name, um, the genus, and the specific epithet, and then the transmission? This poor person is suffering with lymphatic filariasis. So again, the name, scientific name of the helminth and transmission. These are some autopsy results. This is a heart, and this is the brain of a patient um, suffering with cystocercosis. So again, scientific name of the pathogen transmission. And there's a best answer to this one, you guys. So if you think of um, how those cystocerci formed, how did the patient get infected? initially so there's a best answer and then this is related you guys this is called teniasis this is um, I think I put too many yes sorry you guys I misspelled that one <laughs> put too many is's teniasis so this is the adult worm in the intestine right so again the scientific name and again folks think about the transmission cycle how did this person get infected so the best answers for these two questions will actually be different Okay, and then here, folks, I was just trying to give you photos of transmission. So, ooh, can't, ooh, mo mosquito, that's a new type of vector here. Gosh. So here we have a mosquito, a mosquito. Okay, um, which, of, which of the helmets are transferred by mosquitoes, which are transferred by poorly cooked pork pig meat, which can be transferred by poorly cooked bear meat, which can be transferred through fecal oral transmission. Okay, so just examples of the transmission. Okay, and then for those helminthic disease, diseases, folks, there are diagnostic stages, right? So here's a fecal smear from one patient. These are, these are the eggs, the ova that you see, so you want to be able to identify whose eggs are those. Here's a, a fecal smear from another patient. These are the eggs you're seeing, so you want to be able to identify whose eggs are those, right? So examples of fecal oral transmission. Here's a peripheral blood smear from a patient that was taken during the evening. So you see these little parasites there. So you want to, again, try to match that to the disease and the earlier pages. Is it muscle biopsy? And here's a little immature larva here curled up like a cinnamon bun. And then this is an autopsy of brain. And again, we see all these horrific lesions throughout the brain. So you're trying to match up the, um, the disease, clinical signs and symptoms, diagnostic stages, um, and transmission. Okay, And then this last part, you guys, this gets really thick. Um, and again, I, I wish so much that we'd been able to be together face-to-face -face in lab to go over um, especially differential and selective media. But let's just see if we can get through this really quickly, you guys, and I hope this will help. So um, there'll probably be several questions on on the type of media. Um, 
So we had triptych soy auger, so this is all purpose. Um, we had blood auger, this is enrichment for the growth of fastidious microbial pathogens, and it's differential based on homolysis. This is Sabrode's dextrose media, and the name got cut off here. So this is selective for fungi, so we can grow yeasts and molds here. Um, differential based on a low pH and a high glucose dextrose concentration, which will inhibit most bacteria, but most fungi should be able to grow. This is mannitol salt auger plate. It's selective for salt tolerant um, bacteria like members of the genus Staphylococcus, and it's differential based on mannitol fermentation. pH indicator is phenol red, and this is selective and differential. This is McConkie's auger. It selects for the growth of gram negative enterobacteriaceae, um, gram negative bacteria that have evolved to live in the intestinal tract. So they're resistant to bile salts, and they're also resistant to crystal violet. Crystal violet will inhibit a lot of gram positives. Okay, so that was just a quick overview. So that's what we just did, you guys. We just classified each of the media, so you'd want to make sure that you, 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 kn you know how to classify the media for the lab exam. And then there's details, you guys, and this is what makes this section a little bit challenging. So it says, um, oh, fill on the table. Oh, my goodness. Fill in the table. For each of the selective media named above, describe the, in the inhibitors in each, which microbes are inhibited, which microbes can grow, or um, which microbes are selected for. So if we go through this really quick, you guys, the selective media, um, Sabrode's dextrose, remember it's selective for fungi. Um, the inhibitors are the low pH and high glucose or dextrose concentration. So the microbes that will be inhibited are cellular microbes other than fungi, right? So bacteria will be inhibited. Um, the microbes that will be selected to grow will be the, the fungi, and the fungi that would grow here would be the, um, the yeasts and the molds. Okay, so that's the sabrodes dextrose. The mannitol salt, you guys, the inhibitors is the high um, sodium chloride concentration, high salt. It's 7.5% weight per volume. That means for every 100 mils, you're going to add 7.5 grams of sodium chloride. That's going to inhibit most microbes ex except those that have evolved to live in a high salt environment. For example, a high salt environment uh, would be on the surface of our skin, right? Our, our skin is, is salty from sweat for evaporative cooling. So we would predict that um, members of the genus Staphylococcus that have evolved to live on skin could grow in this high salt environment, right? So if we go down here, so the inhibitors are the high salt, 7.5% sodium chloride, which microbes are inhibited. Most microbes that aren't salt tolerant, which microbes um, will grow or are selective for, that would be our salt tolerant Staphylococcus genus, okay? And then folks, the last, um, Selective media here is McConkie's auger. It's selective um, for gram-negative in enterobacteriaceae, gram-negative enteric bacteria. The inhibitors are crystal violet, which will inhibit most gram positives, and um, bile salts, which will inhibit bacteria that haven't evolved to live in the intestinal tract. Okay, so which microbes are inhibited? Gram positives, and in general, bacteria that haven't evolved to live in the intestinal tract. It sele uh, selects for, again, the gram-negative enterobacteriaceae, the so-called enterics. And the one we're really going to focus on, you guys, is going to be E. coli later. Um, later, we're going to see that E. coli, one of the gram-negative enterobacteriaceae, it's called an indicator of fecal contamination. So we're going to see if we find, if we, gr if we grow, identify lots of E. coli in food or drinking water, it makes us really worried feces is present, and then any intestinal or fecal pathogen could be present. Okay, so that's the selective media. This next one, you, you guys, is similar to fill in the table, and this is for the differential media. So with this one, you guys, um, the the um, mechanisms by which we can differentiate between different types of bacteria growing on the differential media. Remember, it's homolysis, lactose fermentation, and mannitol fermentation. So um, homolysis will let us differentiate between different groups of bacteria growing on blood auger. So we could put blood auger here. It's differential based on homolysis. The essential ingredients are going to be the red blood cells, the erythrocytes. There's no pH indicator. And here, folks, you'd want to memorize the three different types of homolysis. Alpha homolysis is so-called partial homolysis. 
without complete destruction of the red blood cell content. So you get a darkish kind of greenish discoloration to the auger. So that's alpha hemolysis. Beta hemolysis is total destruction of the red blood cells and their contents. So in beta hemolysis, the auger becomes clear around the colony. You could read right through it. Gamma hemolysis is no hemolysis, right? So you want to be able to describe the three different types of hemolysis and recognize it on um, blood auger plates that we gave it to you. Um, lactose fermentation, you guys, this is for McConkie auger. And so um, remember we said only the gram-negative Enterobacteriaceae, the enterics, can grow in McConkie's medium. And we can, we can divide them into two big groups based on their ability to ferment lactose or not ferment lactose. So if they can ferment lactose, they'll make acids, the pH will drop, and the neutral red, the pH indicator, is going to turn pink. So lactose fermenting colonies will be pink. And then um, um, colonies um, of bacteria that can't ferment lactose, they have to tear apart amino acids. We get an alkaline reaction. And the neutral red is basically colorless, so not pink. So lac we would say lac positive, pink colonies, lac negative, white colonies or colorless colonies. And then um, mannitol fermentation, this is the differential um, um, phenomenon um, that we're going to see using our mannitol salt auger plate. So remember the mannitol salt auger plate is only salt tolerant bacteria like the members of the genus Staphylococcus will grow. Um, mannitol is a sugar alcohol, so if the microbe can ferment it, acids are produced, the pH will drop, and the pH indicator, which is phenol red, will turn yellow. So we want to remember that our really aggressive tissue invader, Staphylococcus aureus, is mannitol positive. So if we have Staph aureus growing on MSA, it'll turn the um, auger yellow. Its less virulent cousin, Staphylococcus epidermidis, can grow on MSA, but, it, but Staph epi can't ferment mannitol. So um, as a consequence, the Staphylococcus epidermidis tears apart amino acids, releases the amino group as ammonia, which is a weak base. The pH goes up, and the pH indicator phenol red will turn red. Okay, so I think that covers all of this. Okay, Doki. And, and we do have um, photos of the, of the auger plates, you guys, on the following page, but we'll just see if we can't get through these. Okay. And these would be really important questions, you guys. These are great lab exam um, two questions. So um, which of the media would you use if you wanted to select for the growth of salt-tolerant Staphylococcus species? So select means you want to inhibit everybody else and only let the salt-tolerant staph, Staphylococcus species grow. So that would be mannitol salt. If you want to select only for Enterobacteriaceae or gram-negative bacteria resistant to bile salts and crystal violet, you'd use your McConkie's auger. The media we'd use to grow fastidious bacterial pathogens would be the blood auger, the enrichment medium. Okay, and then it goes on and on here, you guys. So, um, so this next question is, I give you a list of gram-positive bacteria that were <clears throat> discussed in the differential selective media, um, movies, um, audios. So these, again, you guys, will be really important. Some of these will be made into clinical cases where you'll have to integrate a lot of a lot of um, a lot of information. So here are your choices, you guys. Um, Streptococcus pyogenes, also called group A streptococci or GAS, group B streptococci um, in veterinary communities, um, group B strep are known as Streptococcus agalactia. Here's Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Streptococcus mutans, and Streptococcus pneumonia. So there's a, a bunch of questions that follow you guys in your ask which of the bacteria, if any, and it might be more than one of them, <clears throat> um, would fit this description. So you guys, which of, which of the bacteria could cause beta hemolysis on blood auger and would be catalase, doggone it, I cannot type, catalase um, um, positive. So folks, you want to remember from chapter 17, <clears throat> the catalase test, um, is run by mixing your uh, bacteria in 3% hydrogen peroxide. If the bacteria have catalase, they'll break down the catalase, uh, releasing molecular oxygen, a gas, so you'll see bubbles, right? And the power of that test is all members of the genus Staphylococcus are catalase positive, and all members of the genus Streptococcus are catalase negative. So that catalase test, you guys, is going to be really important. So... 
Um, and just a real quick summary, you guys remember beta homolysis. We said who are beta hemolytic? Streptococcus pyogenes, group B strep, and staph aureus. So, um, so of these three beta hemolytic bacteria, which would be catalase positive? And that's going to be your staph aureus, okay? And I think I spelled that wrong too. My goodness, you guys never learn to type. Sorry. Okay. All right, and then question seven, which bacteria would cause beta homolysis on blood auger and would be catalase negative? So you guys remember we've got two members of the genus Streptococcus, Streptococcus pyogenes, group A strep, and the group B strep, strep A galactia. These are both beta hemolytic, and because they're members of the genus Streptococcus, they're going to be catalase negative, right? So we'd have strep pyogenes and group B strep is the answer to number seven. Okay, we keep going here. Number eight, which bacteria um, would cause alpha homolysis on blood auger and would be catalase negative? So catalase negative, we're thinking members of the genus Streptococcus. And you might recall from our presentation on homolysis that these two um, species of um, the genus Streptococcus, Streptococcus mutans, which causes dental caries, Streptococcus pneumonia, which causes pneumonia, these are both um, alpha hemolytic. They cause the greenish discoloration on auger, and because they're members of the genus Streptococcus, they're going to be catalase negative. So the alpha hemolytic catalase negative bacteria would be Streptococcus mutans, Streptococcus pneumonia. Which bacterium above would cause gamma homolysis? And remember, that's no homolysis and would be catalase positive. And gamma homolysis, you guys, that's the most common type of homolysis because it's no homolysis. Okay, um, so it's non-hemolytic uh, non and it's catalase positive. It's catalase positive, we're looking for uh, another, another member of the genus uh, Staphylococcus. So our answer to number nine would be Staphylococcus epidermidis. And then which of the bacteria listed above could grow on McConkie's auger? And you guys, none of these are gram-negative enterobacteriaceae. So none of them could grow on McConkie's auger. Okay. Which bacteria above, if any, could grow on MSA? So that would be members of the genus Staphylococcus. So question 11, the answer would be Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis could grow on MSA. If the, we had bacteria growing on the MSA and the auger turns yellow, that's telling us they're fermenting mannitol. And um, when the mannitol is fermented, acids are produced, the pH go da goes down, the pH indicator phenol red turns yellow. Right, so our mannitol fermenting Staphylococcus would be Staphylococcus aureus, okay? And then in contrast, Staph aureus's less virulent cousin, Staphylococcus epidermidis, can grow on MSA but can't ferment mannitol. They tear apart amino acids, the pH goes up, and the phenol red turns red, okay, or pink. So 13, the answer would be Staphylococcus epidermidis. Which pathogens above do what? <laughs> so this is kind of, it's like, why do we care about those pathogens up there? So you guys, so 14A, um, who above is a very aggressive tissue invader, frequently resistant multiple antibiotics? This would be Staphylococcus aureus. We always worry about infections with Staph aureus because they can be so rapidly invasive. Which of the pathogens can cause sore throat? Probably the best answer here would be um, Streptococcus pyogenes. Doggone it. I'll have to go back and correct the typos on the original file, you guys, so I apologize for all the typos. So this would be Streptococcus pyogenes. Which one can cause dental caries and can contribute to periodontal disease? And that would be Streptococcus mutans. Which one can cause pneumonia following influenza infections? This would be Streptococcus pneumonia. Which one can cause, oh, sugar, doggone it. Which one can cause um, neonatal sepsis and meningitis? And that's going to be the group B streptococci, the streptococcus egalactia. Which one is a common commensal of skin but can act as an opportunistic pathogen in immunocompromised patients? And that would be the Staphylococcus epidermidis. And th these are just showing you the plates, you guys. Beta homolysis, remember, beta homolysis is complete clearing 
of the blood auger, you could read newsprint through this. Alpha hemolysis is partial, so-called partial um, hemolysis, this greenish, darkest discoloration of the auger. Gamma hemolysis is no hemolysis. And here's our MSA plate. So um, here we have uh, we have mannitol fermentation. Uh, the phenol red turns yellow. Over here, it's mannitol negative, breaking down amino acids. So mannitol negative, we get an alkaline, nice red color. And the mannitol salt that'd be for our staph aureus, staph epidermidis. And down here, you guys, um, I didn't have any follow-up questions on this one. But on the next um, practice study guide questions, I'll have quite a few questions on um, E. coli and how we're going to use McConkie's media. Remember, McConkie's is going to permit the growth of gram-negative enterobacteriaceae, the enterics that live in the intestines. Um, it's differential based on lactose fermentation. So th this picture didn't come out very well, folks, but um, the pH indicator, neutral red, um, when we have an acidic pH, the neutral red turns red or pink, right? So pink, pink colonies surrounded by pink auger, those would be lactose fermenting colonies. Um, bacteria that can't ferment lactose, say for example, salmonella, they tear about the amino acids, we get an alkaline reaction, and the neutral red is just basically colorless. Okay, so these would be lactose negative, they can't ferment lactose. Both of these guys here are lactose positive, they can ferment lactose. And again, folks, um, probably tomorrow I'll post more um, uh, practice study guide questions and we'll talk about E. coli as an indicator of fecal contamination and how we'll use McConkie's auger to screen food and water for possible fecal contamination. Okay folks, I hope that helps. Oh, let me just back up here really quick you guys. So um, really quick, beta hemolysis, remember Staphylococcus aureus, um, Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as group A Streptococcus and group B Streptococci, um, the Streptococcus agalactia beta hemolytic, alpha hemolytic, Streptococcus mutans, Streptococcus pneumonia, um, and then everybody else, you guys, that I would give you, we would just presume they're going to be uh, ga gamma hemolytic. There, there, there are many more beta and alpha hemolytic um, bacteria out in the world, but we're just going to focus on the few that we've discussed in our unit here. Okay, folks, I hope that helped a little bit. Okay, let's see if I can get us finished here. Okay, and then tomorrow, folks, I'll, I'll post some more practice questions. And I'll go back and, and correct the original file. Sorry for all those typos. That's embarrassing. Okay.